Good morning, family. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. So please uh, come up to us after service and, and we'll hand you a brand new ESV translation version of the Bible. We do not want you to leave here without a Bible in your hands because we value the Word of God and we want to make sure that you have it available to you any day that you choose. Pray with me. Glorious Father, thank you for this morning. God, we lift you up. This is not about us. None of this is about us. It's all about you. God, I pray that we will get rid of all the distractions, all the things that Satan uses to keep our minds off of you and your throne. God, I pray that we could just lay it down at the foot of the cross, not just today, this morning, for an hour, but for all of our lives, that we will not be jaded by what the world has to offer, but we will trust and know that you are God, you are on the throne, and that we will give you our whole entire heart. And so we lift up all of this to you, in Christ's name, amen. So the title of this passage is All Your Heart, and we are going to be going through the entire uh, book of chapter 3 today, but I'm really going to focus in solely on the first seven verses, just for time's sake But I do want to thank Ozon for preaching the word last week about wisdom. I got to listen to it online and watch it. And I hope you caught wisdom last week. I hope you were able to receive it. And I hope you stopped looking elsewhere for wisdom. We have it right in front of us through God. We don't need anything else. We don't need what this world has to offer. We don't need new tricks and new tactics, new books trying to increase our wisdom, we have the one true book, the Bible. But one line that jumped out at me, it was about six or seven minutes into Ozan's introduction, he said, it's not enough to just be a child of God. And it really struck me for a second, and I thought about it, because I knew where Ozan's going, I've known him now for over two years, so I kind of know his heartbeat, I know what makes him tick, I know what he's passionate about, I know the fact that he loves God, and that he wasn't trying to sly the fact of a title that we get being children of God, but it's not enough to just be a child of God. Did anyone else get stopped by that statement? The reason why it stopped me is we sing great songs about being a child of God. We sing them on Sundays. You probably listen to them in the radio when you're on your way to work. But Jesus even said to come to him like a child and to be received as a child. So what in the world was Ozon's quote really about. We have to start by trying to outline how to become a child of God first in order to understand where Ozon was trying to take us last week. Becoming a child of God requires faith in Jesus Christ. It starts there. It has to. John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave us the right through the act of faith when we believe in Him, to be children of God. It starts with faith in Jesus. And Jesus then comes on the scene, lays out what needs to happen in order to become a child of God. Because there are Pharisees and Sadducees trying to trap Him. There are other people trying to get Him to, to, to unpack what this actually meant. And there's several things that Jesus brought up that we really need to understand before we continue on in Proverbs. The first is this. You must be born again. Jesus says you got to be born again. He was visited by a religious leader named Nicodemus, and Jesus did not immediately assure Nicodemus of heaven. But what he did do in John chapter 3, verse 3, he said, Christ told him that he would become a child of God by saying this, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That is an interesting anomaly. And Nicodemus is like, wait a second, I've only been, I've been born from my mother's womb. How in the world can I be born again? How is that even possible? And Jesus is like, is this going to happen through the act of wisdom? Through the act of faith that it's going to transform you and bring you to new life. He goes on and he says, you must receive me, Christ. You must receive me, Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, to all who had received him, those who believed in his name, He has given the right to become children of God. That verse clearly explains how to become a child of God, that we must receive Jesus 
by believing in him and being born again. Our old life is gone and we are now made new in Christ. That's what it means to be born again. Then, then and only then, do you get the title child of God. Just as we had no part in a natural birth, we cannot cause ourselves to be born into God's family by doing good deeds or conjuring up our own faith on our own. I hope you caught it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. God is the one who gave us the right. God gave you the right. If you're a child of God in here today, He gave you that right. But it was first because you believed in Jesus and you've been made born again. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. He lavishes that gift. So you can't earn it on your own. It's a beautiful title, but you can't earn it on your own. Thus, the child of God has nothing to be proud about. His only boast is in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9. So, what did Ozan mean when he said that it's not enough just to be a child of God? It's a great title to be called a child of God. We can all agree that Ozan agrees on how to become a child of God. But what Ozan and what Solomon is saying to his son here is staying as a child of God is not wise. Staying only in title as a child of God and being an infant in Christ is not enough. Wisdom means that we grow to obedience. The last two weeks I've been sick and I've been in and out of the ER several times. And uh, there's a lot going on in my body. Can't explain it. I've lost like 20 pounds. Not interested much in eating. Got massive acid reflux, massive pain in my stomach and intestines, not to gross you out. But I went to see a GI doctor to try to figure this thing out. They did an endoscopy on, on Friday trying to figure out what's going on. They took a, some samples and they're doing a biopsy. I'm supposed to find out on Tuesday. Lord willing, I get an answer. But the last two weeks have really been awful. To the point where I have to put something in my body to give me some form of energy. So I'm eating like a baby. I'm eating a lot of banana. A lot of, you know, mashed potatoes with nothing appealing in it. Just plain. Uh, Eating a lot of really, like, liquidy items. And I might as well just go to the baby food aisle at Safeway and just grab all that I can and just continue eating baby pablum for the rest of my life. But... Am I going to sustain on baby pablum the rest of my life? Absolutely not. We have to have some nourishment of meat. We got to have some nourishment of tofu. We got to have some carbs. We got to have some protein. We got to have something to help us grow, right? Physically. The same thing happens to us spiritually. And the problem that is facing our world today and why Solomon is going after his son and trying to challenge him is because we have too many baby Christians that love the title as a child of God but want nothing more than that. As long as I get that title as a child of God, I get to be with him in heaven, then I guess I can live my life the rest of the way I want to live it. The point of Ozon and what Solomon is trying to say, what Jesus said, what Paul said, what I'm trying to deliver today is we have to grow beyond baby. Because if we don't grow beyond baby, what we are faced with is constant, constantly being lied to, constantly following itchy doctrine of what our itchy ears want to hear, and we're tossed back and forth by waves of the sea. What Ozan was saying last week, and I hope you caught it, is wisdom leads us. True wisdom, godly wisdom, leads us to obedience. Obeying Christ. Obeying God's laws. Wisdom through obedience leads to growth as children. It's not just being born again and becoming a child of God, but now it's growing in God and being more like His Son, Jesus. It is growing beyond infancy and childlike ways, to mature Christ following. We all know what childlike ways are. La, 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 la. I don't need to listen to you. I have it all figured out. And I'm sure none of us in here were ever that way to our parents. I'm sure we never used the line, I know, I know, I know, let me do it. Leave me alone, I can do this. And we laugh about this because we remember what it was like to be a child 
The funny thing is we got a lot of grown-up adults acting like children because we're seeking wisdom outside of obedience to Christ. Paul calls this out in 1 Corinthians. We just got done 1 Corinthians, but just to remind us and give us a fresher, in chapter 3, he said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. That's like a massive slap to the face, just so you know. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are fleshly, and you are not walking like mere men. What Paul was saying to the church in Corinth, it's a church of people that know better. However, they've got a beautiful title as being children of God, but that's it. They're children of God. That's not being taken away, but they're acting like fools. They're acting like kids. And Paul's like, guys, I can't even talk to you like adults. You should be on to something greater than this. I'm giving you milk. That's it. Quite frankly, I'm even writing you this letter, and you're still not ready because you're infighting, and there's strifing going on, and there's issues in your marriage going on, and there's all these other things going on. You're acting like children. Kind of puts it into perspective a little bit. How about in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11? Concerning him, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That's this. Everybody stick your fingers in your ears. Now talk to your neighbor and see if you can hear their voice. And look at them and say, you look foolish. (laughs) That's what was going on here in Hebrews. Because you're dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers... You have need, again, for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now I'll stop here just for a second. How many have been in the church, and when I say church, I'm not saying this church, but in God's greater kingdom of the church for over 20 years. How come you're not teaching yet? Why aren't we teaching? It's been great to have a a teaching team and a preaching team. This is great. We also have life group leaders. We also need more life groups. We also need more leaders for youth ministry. We need more, more teachers for children's ministry. Not only that, your neighbors need to be taught what it's like to understand who Jesus is. And so what, what Solomon is trying to teach his son, what Ozon was trying to deliver last week for us about wisdom, what I'm trying to deliver today through this, this, this letter in Proverbs 3, why aren't we teaching yet? Well, I need more time, James. Really? Do you? And you're probably mad at me for even calling it out, but I'm not, I'm not the Holy Spirit in you, okay? If you've been sitting on the sideline or on a chair or on a pew because you're waiting for the right time, but yet God has been like pushing you and probing you by the power of His Spirit and you're not acting on it, that's disobedience, which therefore is not wisdom, right? Wisdom leads us to obedience. I'll tell you right now, if I left the ministry, if I just said, you know, I quit the ministry, I'm done, I can't handle it anymore, I guarantee you I'd still be teaching about Jesus. Because it's in me. It hits you right in the gut. Because we wouldn't be able to praise Him during worship if it wasn't for the transformational power of His grace. So am I thankful that you're children of God? Absolutely. But where do we take that next is the question. So heavenly wisdom tells us that we are more than just children of God, although it's a major honor. And I know that's Ozon's uh, uh, decision last week would be that's a major honor. Do not lose sight of that. But we need to grow in God to become more like Christ. Amen? 
All right, so grab your Bible. Sorry for the spiritual spanking, but it's going to continue. Here we go. It says, my son, do not forget my teaching. Imagine a father sitting with a son. It's hard not to think about because i got three boys. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and favor in man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. But not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord. And turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Anyone need some refreshment today? Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. See, I don't have to talk on tithing. It tells you right here. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of that. Whatever it is. Five, ten, whatever. You feel God telling you to do, you offer that before Him. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. It's interesting that Solomon is sharing this with his son because Solomon was wealthy. And he still was like, you got to keep pouring out. you got to keep giving. He says again in verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. And the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. What are we doing now? We're trying to find gold. We're trying to find silver. We're trying to find cryptocurrency. We're trying to put more in the bank. We're trying to do all these things. Yeah, that's worldly wisdom. But look at what he's saying. Wisdom from God is more valuable than any of that stuff since she is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life for those who lay hold to her. Those who hold fast are called blessed. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds dropped down with dew. My son, do not lose sight of these Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and an adornment around your neck. There's, he's echoing it again. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. How many would love to not stumble and fall? <coughs> it was a great DC Talk song. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. How many want good sleep? Ugh. No more melatonin. Do not be afraid of sudden terror of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the fear will be your, uh, but the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. You don't have to fear this world. We fear the Lord. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not Plan evil against your brother who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason. He who has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are his confidence. This is basically saying, don't worry about everybody else. God's going to take care of it. It's that simple. But we forget. The The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but... He blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. And the wise will inherit honor, but fools will get disgrace. Amen. Thank you for the word, Lord. Did we learn anything from just reading that? This morning we're going to be walking through trusting the Lord with all of our heart. However, we have to read through this knowing that trusting the Lord with all of our heart is the wisest thing you can do. 
It's the wisest thing you can do. If you remember nothing about today, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Focus on that verse. Meditate on it. Wrap it around your neck. Wear it. Adorn it. It is wise to trust the Lord with all your heart because here's the thing. There's two ways. You either trust the Lord with all your heart or as according to Scripture, you're a fool. That's it. It's two ways. Now, I have many a times not trusted the Lord with all my heart. Therefore, there have been many decisions that I have made that are absolutely foolish. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that has ever made a foolish decision. Ever. And I will tell you, the moment you make that foolish decision, it's because you're not trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, and you are actually leaning on your own understanding. So if we want to stop being a fool, then we need to begin to trust the Lord with everything. So let's walk through it. Verse 1. Give him your whole heart. He says, My son, do not forget my law or teaching. As Solomon is trying to give his son advice, it begins with a warning. He says, Look, son, I love you. I love you so much that I want to bring you a challenge. You are mine. I plead with you. I beg you. Never to forget God's law. Never to forget God's word. See, Solomon wasn't talking about his earthly father role of his laws and his rules to his son. He was pointing his son to the largest relationship that he could possibly have with his father in heaven. He's saying, you have God's word and his law. I want you to focus in on that and that only. See, he knew, Solomon knew, that God's law was beautiful and it was good. Solomon was also replaying the tape of his own life and bad decisions, that any time he went outside of God's law, he was being disobedient and had to pay repercussions of those decisions. So he's like, as any good dad would do, sit down with their kid and go, don't be like me. Don't do what I did. In fact, I don't necessarily even need you listening to me. I need you listening to God's law. Because guess what, parents? God's law supersedes yours. And it's way better written than anything you can conjure up on your own. And what's great about God's law is it'll talk about all the things that you wish you could impart on your child anyway. So you might as well teach them God's law. And that's what Solomon was trying to do. He's like, look. I love you. And I could just picture him like having his son on his knee. Going, let me give you some of the wisdom. But what's great about this is he goes, it's not wisdom of me. It's wisdom of God's law. He goes on in verse 1. He says, let your heart keep my commandments. What he's saying is let your heart keep God's word. See, obedience is one of the heart. And our goal is obedience is not mere outward conformity to God's will, but a heart that loves and obeys Him. What this means is, a childlike, I'm a child of God, but I don't want to grow version versus a mature Christ follower. It would look something like this. Son, I want you to keep God's law and His commandments. Oh man, do I have to? That's a child. And as child of, of, of God, we or children of God, we do the same thing. Oh, do I have to? Do I really have to go forgive that person? Do I really not get to talk bad about them behind their back? Really? Immaturity. Not wise. Mature Christ followers, I get to. I get to forgive. I get to not talk about that person behind their back. Because I'm a mature child of God. See the difference? The heart is the first thing that wanders away from God, and yet it's the first thing that returns to Him. Everything rises and falls on our hearts. And if you don't believe me, let's go back to Jesus for a moment. 
When Jesus was here, what did he do? He was trying to challenge the hearts of every man and woman and child. He was constantly getting into their lives, like breaking open their chest cavity, trying to expose what's really going on inside. And to a lot of people, that's uncomfortable, and they didn't like it, therefore they crucified him. But there were a few that were like, oh, yes, take out this old heart and make me new again. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, the context is before Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And on one occasion, Jesus was traveling and an expert in the law started testing him. And he says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke tells us Jesus' answer. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And a second... Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why did he tell him that? Because he knew the heart of the individual asking the question. What do I need to do to to enter eternal life? Well, it's easy. You need to love the Lord with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your will. Love him with all of it. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were big into knowledge, trying to puff up what they experienced through God's law, but it was not at all evident in their heart. And this is why Jesus continued to push on them, because he knew inside they were whitewashed tombs. And there are plenty of false people walking around with the title child of God but are whitewashed tombs on the inside, filling their head with knowledge but never living it out with their whole heart the way God's law was commanded to. Jesus is concerned about your heart and he's concerned about it today. And wisdom says we need to give Jesus our entire heart not just partial parts of it. And we're going to continue reading that. In verse 3, Solomon says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. In some of your translations, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Solomon wisely tells his son to keep God's loyal love and mercy and truth close. See, we need God's truth. We don't need my truth as my truth garbage. We need God's truth. We don't need what what other people and culture's truth necessarily is. We need God's truth. What's His Word say? Right? Now, we don't need to be jerks with what we know God's Word to say on people that don't understand it. Okay, that wouldn't be wise. That's not loving our neighbor. But I don't need to go and, and try to soak in Everyone, other, everyone else's aspects of what their truth is, I need to come back to the Word. And that's Solomon's point. He's like, look, you're going to grow up and you're going to be bombarded by everybody else's opinions. I need you to focus in on God's truth and not forsake that. He says you should be so close to it that you would, you would have it as a necklace wrapped around your neck. Bind it around your neck. And write them down on the tablet of your heart. This is great visual imagery in writing. To bind and to write them are striking expressions for glorying in and meditating on. So what he's saying is, is if all you're going to do is read a verse of God's law once a week and you expect that to give you the full nourishment you need to grow, you're missing it. So once again, this comes back to us as the church. If all we do is focus in on Sunday morning, and we try to make Sunday morning the main thing, and that's it, and we don't at all encourage you to take your Bible, God's truth, and read it all day, every day, throughout your week, then shame on us. It's more than just reading Proverbs 3 on Sunday, because I guarantee you by the time you get to Thursday, you're ready to go jump. 
You're like, I need something more. I can't just keep focusing back on Sunday's nourishment. That's right. You need more gas in the tank. The only way that's possible is by binding God's Word around your neck and writing it down on the tablet of your heart. Journaling. Devotion. And it's, once again, not a, oh, do I have to? It's a, I get to. You get to learn more about the God you love. And you get to learn more about the, the child of God that He loves. Because He can't wait to bring out the junk in your life and go, why are you doing that? Why do you react that way? Why do you step on the gas rather than slam on the brake? What's going on in you? Let me call it out. And He will do that by His loving Word. But it comes from us having a deeper relationship with Him. So if you've got a bad concept of a relationship with God and you're only reading because you're like, I need answers because I don't know what to do. And if that's your only reason for doing it, you're missing the fullness of God. If you've gone and exhausted all your options and now you're coming back and going, hey, I need more. I'm finally ready. Well, that's good that you're finally ready, but now let's keep the rhythm going. How do we do this in a technological age? Everyone's on their phones. And you can't tell me you're on your phone on the Bible app. Right? Well, James, it's right here. Yeah, it's like buried in one of your folders over here. You know, and mine's on the front page, but I'm not always on my phone hitting the Bible app. We're taking photos or I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling uh, uh, Fox News or some news article to find out what the next war is happening. You know, how is that wisdom? You know, at the end of the day, it's like one of those things. What do we do? Maybe on, if we're lucky, on one occasion, we might open our note app and write down a verse or some quote that we got and we tuck it away. But God has given us His Word and we don't have to depart from it. By binding and writing, the teacher Solomon is stressing that Teachings become part of the disciplined nature of the Christian. So you know how they say it takes 30 days to, to build a habit, right? Or to break a habit? To build some, some, like if you're trying to work out or something like that, go 30 days and then finally now you're ready? Pick up your Bible and begin to read. I'm telling you, it's filled with nourishment. This is probably what compelled the WWJD uh, bracelets back in the 90s. You know, they got the uh, what would Jesus do bracelet, and it was probably because, oh, you see it. Oh, I better stop doing what I was about to do. What would Jesus do in this moment, right? This is probably why tattoos have caught on and, and picked up some, some steam is because people want some spiritual tattoo, and they go, okay, yep, I see Jesus on my arm, or here's that verse that's reminding me I'm a child of God. I can't partake in this kind of atmosphere again. But Why? Why do people need to bind it on their neck? Why do people write it down and tattoo it? Why do people have to write it down on the tablet of their heart? Why? Because humans easily forget. We forget. Especially children. So this is wise counsel to continue to grow up in the ways of the Lord through active obedience and not complacency. Because as children of God that choose not to grow, we're complacent and we forget. He goes on in verse 4, he says, so you will find favor. That's a great word. How many people like favor? Not like, will you do me a favor, but you want favor. The reason why we like favor is because we want to, to be liked. We want people to respect us. But the word favor actually means here in the Hebrew, grace. It gives grace means that others will recognize the competence and intelligence of the wise individual who is obedient to God's Word. Solomon is saying to his son to have favor not only before God but before all men. You need to be completely obedient to God by giving Him your entire heart. I mean, we got plenty of examples. you got Joseph, Moses, and David all had favor. David was a man after God's own heart and Whatsoever he did pleased the people in return. So when David was in the Word and writing it and remembering it and regurgitating it and chewing it again and regurgitating it, not only did he have favor with God, he had favor with the people that he was ruling. But when David 
put it to the side, what happened? He didn't have favor with people. And he also didn't have favor with God. Why? Because he was living in his own sin. So Solomon is like, son, if you want favor before the Lord and you want favor before man, it's by God's grace through his word. Lean into it. Be obedient to it. Why? Because it's God that gives it. God gives the gift of grace. There's nothing you can do to earn it. He showers it down over and over and over again when we're in his word. Verse 5, he goes, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, this is, this is good. Solomon advised his son to live a life of trust in God and God alone. So think about all the wise counsel that Solomon had around him in, in human form. He had a ton of wise individuals. And there were people in his, in his culture that were really sharp thinkers. But even at the end of the day, he's like, you know, I don't need that. Although he did in moments have them come in and talk to him, he needed God. When was the first time that you went to God right away rather than last? Or after you've exhausted all the other bits of counsel on earth and then you came to him? Solomon's going, you got to go to God and trust in Him. Solomon had found that God was worthy to be trusted. It is our nature to put our trust in something else or someone else than God first. How many want to own that? Anybody put their trust in other things before God? Oh my goodness, are we alive in here? I didn't know I walked into a perfect church. This is incredible. Solomon told us consciously to put our trust. He told his son consciously to put his trust in the Lord. We have to consciously go, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I might not feel it. And the waves are crashing in on me and the walls are closing in. But I trust in you. Here's another word search in Hebrew. The word trust in Hebrew is translated this, lying helpless, face down. So think about that visual imagery. I'm just going to do it. Lying helpless, face down. Do we do this with our relationship with God? Some of you are like, James, this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable that you're laying face down on the floor. What's it look like in our prayer life? I need you, Lord. I need you now. Uh, uh, something's going on. I'm, I'm really struggling. I need you now. Does that look like lying helpless, face down? That looks like anxious prayer. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't answer through anxiety prayers. God is God. He'll answer however he wants to. Humbly laying down and trusting God. What a beautiful imagery. I don't know when the last time was that I laid down face first, helpless before the Lord. It makes worship seem a little different, doesn't it? We stand and we raise our hands and those are beautiful things, but what would it look like if somebody were to walk in here and we're all face down on the floor during worship? People would be like, what the heck is going on? That's what Solomon is trying to teach his son. He's like, look, before you go out, before you talk to anybody, lie face down helplessly before the Lord and get your marching orders. It's a picture of a servant waiting for the master's command and readiness to obey. And we are called family as children of God. How many of us are children of God in here? We are called to yield, obey, lie helpless and face down with our whole heart. Our whole heart. If trust in God is to be true, it must be complete. To put half our trust in God and half our trust in something else or someone else is a real failure in trust of the Lord at all and you're actually what Scripture calls a fool. So that means every single person in this room, we are a fool sometimes. We're a fool. 
It's a quote by Trapp. He says, He that stands with one foot on the rock and another foot upon quicksand will sink and perish as certainly as he that stands with both feet in quicksand. I can't be on the rock going, God, I need you! And one hand up here and then one leg in, the, in quicksand and go, I need you! <laughs> I need you now! <laughs> I need you! You're still going to sink. You're on your own. Right? And we learned a few weeks back, it's like he's going to laugh at our calamity and will mock those that terror, when terror strikes them because he gives wisdom and we go, la, 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 I'm a child of God. I don't need to listen. Right? And then we start sinking in our own quicksand and we're like, why am I in this quicksand, God? And he's like, um, like, right? Visual? Okay, let's keep going. With all our hearts mean that we are growing to maturity beyond just being a child of God and calling us to us good now. Solomon then follows it up with uh, continuing in verse 5. Lean not on your own understanding. Now I love this visual too. This is what's great about Proverbs. There's so many visual imagery. So many things that we can take and, and kind of unpack it. Trusting God with all your heart means to decide to put away your own childlike understanding, and instead choose to trust God in His understanding. When it says, lean not, do not rely or lean on, or, or it, it depicts basically you're trusting other things that are broken rather than Him that is complete. So, for instance, I got two crutches here. One is good, one is broken. You're looking at this, and if any of you had a broken foot or an issue where you needed crutches, and I said, here, I have some. You're going to look at this and go, um, I am not about to lean on broken crutches because I'm going to fall and look like a total goofball and hurt myself so much more. This is what we do in life. I'm going to trust our government. <laughs> I'm going to trust science. I'm going to trust my friends. I'm going to trust, guess what, family? Government's broken. Science is broken. Your friend is broken. You are broken. I am broken. And Solomon is saying to his son, don't trust everything else. Trust God. He is not broken. He is complete. So why in the world are we leaning on our own understanding? Why are we leaning on our somebody else that we think we can trust? Why are we leaning on government? Why are we leaning on subsidies? Why are we leaning on our bank account? Why are we leaning on things that come and go? Can we see it now? And yet some of us, we're going to walk out of here on broken crutches. We're going to be like, that was a good word. I thought it was a good word. Yeah, it was a good word. And we're going to walk out of here doing the same thing we just did an hour before. And I'm the first to own that because we forget. You can't give God half your heart, 99.9%, and expect not to sink. He wants it all. And that's hard for religious people. That's hard for wealthy people to understand too. Hence the reason why Jesus said, you have to love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, body, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't do enough good deeds to get your way into heaven. It's by being born again and trusting, lying helplessly before him and being obedient to his law. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. If you trust your own heart, you're a fool. And I hate to say that because it's not easy to call you a fool. But I'm a fool too. We can't be trusted. Can't be trusted. And, the, and Scripture even calls out the heart. What a, what a cesspool it is. Yeah, we might look. We might look on Sunday like we have it all together. But I guarantee you, something's up with your heart that needs to get right before the Lord. Just as much as I know there's something up with my heart that needs to get right with the Lord. Self-sufficiency and self-dependence have been the ruin of mankind since Adam. 
This one quote, remember this, is from a guy named Clark. He says, the grand sin of the human race is their continual endeavor to live independently from God. Oh. Oh. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him. Trusting God with all your heart means to honor and acknowledge him in all things, in all activities, in all actions. It is the choice to invite God into our everyday life and have him conduct it as he sees fit. It is to practice the presence of God in the regular and sometimes mundane things that happen every day. So if you drive into King County every day, and that's a mundane, annoying experience, invite God into that experience with you. You might see less red in your eyes, and you might see a little bit more heaven. Right? When we give Him the mundane. I'm not saying just go and ask Him, for those last minute things, should I stay in the state? Should I leave the state? Should I move to take this job? Should I not move to take this job? Should I invest in this? Should I not invest in that? All those are good to invite him into and let him conduct it the way he wants to. But I'm talking just the mundane stuff. Waking up in the morning, glorifying God as you make breakfast, glorifying God in every action of your life, in everything, not just the big stuff. And the last part of of verse 6 is scary for a lot of people. It says, In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Now for some of you, you're going, man, that sounds really appealing. Others of you, it goes, whoa, that's scary. The reason why this is scary is because we don't doubt that God will direct. As children of God, we know God's going to direct. It's scary because we are not sure His direction is our direction. So I can't give Him everything. Because if I give Him everything, He's going to do something that goes differently than what I want. Once again, that's a childlike response. It's putting our thumb in our mouth and going, No! I'm not going to give you everything because this thing right here, I want to really have it go this way. And I know that if I give it to you, you're going you're gonna to really tell me to go a different way. And we have to go and put down our blankie and go fine. And so that's why it's scary for us. And As Solomon is telling his son this, he knows. Solomon's made big decisions. Decisions that blew up in his face because he did not give everything to God. So he knows by giving things to God, God will direct his steps. And so he's trying to encourage his son, and what we're trying to encourage you today is trust in God in all of these things, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. God will direct your path with everything in life. He promises to do that. But God wants to direct your path to the fulfillment of, guess what? His will, not your will. Not your will. Ugh. Not my will? Ugh. Can I be honest for a second, if I haven't been so far? He doesn't care about your independent will. He doesn't. And why? The reason for this is because it shows the heart issue. Well, actually, that he does care about your independent will because it does show your heart issue. Because when you want your will rather than his will, it already shows an issue in your heart that he's going, bink. This is why I'm not allowing you to go this direction because, bink, your heart's got something inside that needs to be pulled out and I want to fi- heal it. So if you don't have an answer yet because you're trying to make your own plans, There might be a reason. Why is there a heart issue? It goes back to Clark's quote. The grand sin of the human race is their continual endeavor to live independently from God. Matthew chapter 6 says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will. Bind that on your heart. Bind that and wrap that around your neck. Tattoo that if you want to. 
get a bracelet that says your will be done. It's his will. More than a few of us are afraid to have God direct our paths. And this is actually the strong difference between children of God in immaturity and mature Christ followers. And it goes back to that childlike attitude. I don't want to know. Or let me do it myself. I know, I know, I know. This is at the root, fundamentally the problem in why Solomon is writing his son. This attitude is showing that the heart doesn't trust in the Lord with all of it. And that's what Solomon is trying to expose with his son, and that's what we're trying to expose in ourselves. The surrendered heart delights in God's direction and in God's path. You know what? This is bold. God, I want your path. I want your path. Am I tired of this world? Absolutely. Am I tired of what's going on in this state? Absolutely. Am I tired of the laws and the rules that are phony and fake and make no sense? Absolutely. But God, I want your path. If that means here, if that means there, if that means over there, wherever it means, God, I want you and nothing else. Why? Because so many times... I was a fool and I took my own path and it led to absolute pain and agony. And Solomon, I could just see him as the tears are rolling down his face as he's trying to teach his son. Because if you could follow God with all your heart, you're not going to have the baggage that I carry. And I guarantee you, some of us are still carrying some of the wounds of the baggage from our own bad decisions. One of the biggest questions I get as a pastor is, how will I know the will of God? Well, the beautiful thing is Solomon gave us the wonderful answers. He says this, decide to put your full trust in the Lord. That's number one. Decide to not trust in your own understanding, but give attention and priority to God's revealed word. And the third way to figure this out is to decide to acknowledge and honor God with all that you do. Then you will know his purpose for your life guaranteed when we do those things we can trust that god will direct our paths and that our heart is willing to receive his direction so i'm going to close with this question all eyes are closed please and this is between you and the lord i'm not going to have you raise a hand i'm not going to have you look at me but as you as you quietly leave today please really wrestle with this question son and daughter of god Do you trust God's will with your whole heart? And if not, why? Holy Spirit, I pray that we will wrestle through that question this week. God, I know that there are people that are wrestling with what to do next, where to go, what job to take, where to put our kids in school or to not put our kids in school, and a variety of other questions. God, I pray that they will wrestle through the trusting in you question. Have they lied face down, helpless before you, and have given you their whole heart? God, I pray that we could get to that place in relationship with you. In Christ's name, amen.